Chris Presser and Dr. Joel Kahn just debated veganism and the value of animal products in the diet on Joe Rogan's podcast. I'm Dr. Chris Masterjohn, and this is my post-game analysis. So first of all, who are these people and who am I? Joe Rogan is a former martial arts competitor. He spent decades as a successful comedian, and now he runs the wildly popular podcast, The Joe Rogan Experience, covering everything from the interesting to the funny to the provocative and controversial. Chris Kresser is a practitioner and teacher of functional medicine. He is the co-director of the California Center for Functional Medicine, and he is the founder of the Kresser Institute. He's authored two books, one on his version of the animal-inclusive paleo diet and the other on the future of functional medicine. Dr. Joel Kahn is a practicing cardiologist. He follows and advocates a whole foods, plant-based vegan diet, and he runs several restaurants and has authored several books and often teaches on this theme. As for me, I'm Dr. Chris Masterjohn. I have a PhD in nutritional sciences from the University of Connecticut, and I did my postdoctoral research at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and then served for a little under three years as assistant professor of health and nutrition sciences at Brooklyn College in Brooklyn, New York. Now I work independently, full-time, making educational content about health and nutrition. I'm the same Chris Master, John, who was mentioned in this debate when Dr. Joel Kahn said it was unfair to use a reference from me. If it you, can't be you Chris Master, back, John reference. That's it's not, not fair. It's not Chris Master, John. I myself have also participated in debates about veganism with Dr. T. Colin Campbell, Dr. Neil Barnard, Gene Bauer, author of Farm Sanctuary, and Dr. Michael Greger. In this video, I'm going to do my best to even-handedly extract what I consider the most important arguments on each side of the debate, present them fairly, and then weigh in with my own analysis and opinion. Now, on to the debate. So, first of all, what is it that Joel Kahn and Chris Kresser agree on? Well, for starters, they're both practitioners of functional medicine or root cause medicine, where they view the patient holistically, try to get to the bottom of the disease process, preventing diseases when possible with attention to diet and lifestyle. Here's Joel Kahn talking about their agreement on this topic. We also, Chris and I, share a lot in common. I mean, one, if we ate together, it would probably be 90% the same. We both are really respectful of what we call functional medicine, root cause medicine. I don't write scripts without thinking about the patient. He certainly doesn't do that without thinking about the entire patient. Second of all, Kresser, Kahn, and Rogan all agreed that the standard American diet is pretty terrible and that veganism can be a major improvement over the standard American diet as long as it's properly supplemented with nutrients that can be missing. So I think one thing that we can absolutely agree on is that the standard American diet sucks and that a vegan diet is superior to the standard American diet. These these two Amen, things, brother. These two things are agreed, if, right? If the vegan Supplement, is supplementing, supplementing wisely. wisely. I just in fact, Kahn and Crusser were both in agreement that animal foods are important sources of vitamins and minerals. Here's Kahn taking supplements on air, illustrating this point. This is a real problem. Nobody's denying it. Chris has laid it out well. It's such a simple solution. I'm going to demonstrate my B12. And what's the source of your B12? It's synthesized methylcobalamin. I just got 1,000 micrograms of vitamin B12 with 400 400 milligrams of DHA with 2,000 international units of vitamin D3. And And that's all vegan. I just did that once a day and I'm done, you know. Chris, I couldn't agree more. I've written many articles, don't be a dumb vegan. And I don't mean to offend, (laughs) but, you know, uh, what, you know, you, you, we are prone. I mean, there's no bullshit here. This is too important for people. We are prone to have a few holes in the wall that an intelligent person knows how to plug. It's, it's vitamin D, it's DHA, it's B12. You might go on to say iodine, taurine, vanadium, chromium. I just got those. That's what I do every other day. I'm totally complete. My patients are totally complete. The industry has provided solutions to a relatively simple problem. They also agreed that plant foods play an important role in the diet and that it's generally healthy to eat a diet rich in plants. Up your veggies, listeners, and you'll counteract a lot of the crap that's out there in the world. It's an important message. I don't disagree with that. No, you know. So what did they disagree on? Well, the question came down to, 
let's say that you have a whole foods plant-based vegan diet and you have a plate full of healthy whole plant foods. Well, what if you take out a portion of those plant foods and you put in nutrient-dense animal foods that provide important sources of nutrients? Khan took the position that there are aspects of the animal foods that are so harmful that it is better to not have the animal foods and instead get the nutrients that would be missing from supplements so that you can get the benefit of the supplements and avoid the harms of the animal foods. Here's Khan taking that position. Is it, is it fair to say that you believe that what the vegan diet is, is like you can essentially hack your way to a better, healthier life by just adding a few things like B12, a few other right. nutrients that you're not going to get from the diet, but with those together, you feel like you're far healthier? Well, because... What I didn't get, I substituted. Right. But what I don't want, I'm not taking in, which is animal saturated fat, animal protein. I'm not taking so in. So that's the main disagreement here. Kresser took the position that it's better to get the nutrients you need from food. And if so, the best sources of some of those nutrients are animal foods, it's better to include animal foods in the diet so that you can get all your nutrition and you can get all the nutrients from food. But it does beg the question of whether we should be following a diet that can't meet our essential nutrient needs and that leads to deficiencies of many other nutrients much more commonly than an omnivorous diet. But let's look at things like calcium. Let's look at iron. Let's look at zinc. Let's look at choline. Let's look at taurine. Let's look at creatine. Let's look at retinol, which is preformed vitamin A. Let's look at EPA and DHA. All of these are shown to be lower in vegetarians and vegans than they are in omnivores. And it just, yes, you can supplement, but it just, you know, are, do, do the supplements have the same effect? I just think it's better to get nutrients from food if you can, because that's the way we've been getting them for right. millions of years, you know? Let's we can split up this disagreement into two components. The first is, are the things that Khan says are harmful about animal products truly harmful? The second is, does it really matter whether you get those nutrients from foods or from supplements? Overwhelmingly, the time spent in the debate was about the first point, and very little time was spent on the second. Joel Kahn argued that there were four main mechanisms that meat is meat and other animal products is harmful to most people. The first is saturated fat, the second is cholesterol. The third is a compound known as TMAO. And the fourth is that animal protein is very rich in a specific amino acid known as methionine. Of these four, overwhelmingly, the time spent in the debate was devoted to saturated fat. Well over an hour was devoted to, the, to debating whether saturated fat is harmful. I found this disappointing. Because as Chris Kresser pointed out when this topic opened, saturated fat has nothing to do with animal foods versus plant foods. And in fact, two tablespoons of olive oil has more saturated fat than a seven ounce pork chop. I would add to this that the richest source of saturated fat on the market is coconut oil. Coconut oil is a plant food. Coconut oil is completely vegan. There's far more saturated fat in coconut oil than there is in any animal product. And in fact, if you look at traditional diets across the globe, the diets that are richest in saturated fat are the Pacific Island diets where coconut is the main source of fat. And although these diets aren't vegan, the saturated fat in these diets is all coming from almost exclusively plant foods. As such, I thought it was unfortunate that so much time was spent on saturated fat and so little time was spent on dietary cholesterol, something that is only found in animal foods and is highly re relevant to the question of animal versus plant. With that said, with so much time devoted to the topic of saturated fat in the debate, let's take a look at what was said and make this part of our post-game analysis. Joel Kahn advocated the conventional point of view called the lipid hypothesis, where saturated fat and, to a lesser degree, cholesterol in the diet drive up blood cholesterol levels, 
And because blood cholesterol levels increase, the cholesterol becomes more likely to get into the arterial wall where it causes an atherosclerotic plaque and that this is what leads to cardiovascular diseases that cause heart attacks and strokes. When you eat foods rich in saturated fat, which is called meat, cheese, eggs, and such, receptors on your liver for cholesterol. I've got cholesterol in my blood. I'd like to get some of it out into the liver to be metabolized. I need a receptor. You eat saturated fats, receptors go down. Cholesterol has no place to go. Cholesterol stays in the blood, bumps into your artery wall. I'm putting a stent in your artery. That's the basic biochemistry. Chris Kresser took the position that saturated fat, on average, does not raise cholesterol levels, but it only raises cholesterol levels in some people. And some people need to restrict their saturated fat to control their blood lipids, but the average person does not. Kresser further argued that studies showing that saturated fat raises cholesterol don't show that saturated fat causes heart disease because cholesterol is just an intermediate marker. Instead, we need to look at studies on the direct impact on heart disease and an overall view when we take recent systematic reviews and meta-analyses, which are studies that pool the data from many other studies and look at the overall results, is that saturated fat is not convincingly implicated as a cause of heart disease. Yeah, that early studies showed some relationship, but they were short, very short term between eating saturated fat and then, and then cholesterol. The other problem is they were using cholesterol as a proxy marker. They weren't looking at did people eat saturated fat and die more? They looked at, did saturated fat increase cholesterol? Um, so when they, when they did longer-term studies, there's no increase in cholesterol on average. That doesn't mean no one will experience an increase. That's not true. Some people will. But on average, there was no increase. In, and then when they looked at, they just took cholesterol out of the equation. Let's just look at, is there an increase in heart attacks or death from eating saturated fat? When they did that, there's no increase. And in, in, in these are uh, that, those are observational studies, and we have all these randomized controlled trials that are showing no, no increase in cholesterol, no increase in insulin levels, and actually a decrease in all of those markers. Why were Kahn and Kresser looking at the topic of saturated fat and heart disease so differently? Both of them wanted to look at what they considered the big picture, but they were considering what constitutes the big picture differently. Kahn was trying to paint a very clean story that ties together biochemistry, historical pivotal studies that originally led to changes in our viewpoints with observational data and randomized controlled trials. And when he would try to tie them together, he would often pick individual studies to demonstrate his point because they were so consistent with this one stream of very clean data. On the other hand, Kresser wanted to look at recent collections of all what he considered the most convincing data. For example, when there were randomized controlled trials, Kresser wanted to consider them over the observational studies because they're better at showing cause and effect. When there were recent reviews and meta-analyses of randomized controlled trials, Kresser wanted to prioritize those over individual studies. And if the randomized controlled trials in net, or when needed, if the observational studies in net didn't convincingly show that one thing caused another, he dismissed everything else in the chain, dismissing the mechanisms involved or the pivotal studies that may have led to us originally thinking something, because if the pattern just doesn't hold up as a thing in the diet causing a disease today, there's no point in considering or spending so much time debating the mechanisms or what we thought in the past. So with just a few principles involved, how did they spend over an hour on the topic of saturated fat in heart disease. Well, part of the problem was that when Kresser tried to broaden the view, Kahn felt that they hadn't finished talking about the topic and wanted to narrow back the focus. For example, Kresser brought up eggs and cholesterol, but very little engagement was seen from Kahn. Kresser brought up low-carbohydrate studies 
because the low carbohydrate studies use diets that are generally high in saturated fat. And so they tie into the topic, but Khan wanted to stay away from low carb and just stick to saturated fat until they finished it. It's a different topic. It's eggs, it's cholesterol. We were talking saturated fat, does it raise your cholesterol? So they're different topics. And then we've introduced a very hot topic about LDL particle size, which we should break down and talk about. So I'm not sure quite how to respond because we got off track by shifting to consistently low carb and eggs and other Actually, things. Actually, we were talking about cholesterol. Well, we were talking about does saturated, fat, saturated fat, fat raise blood cholesterol? So another reason they stayed on this topic for such a long time is that Joe Rogan kept pressing Khan, if he's going to take this position, he needs to describe specifically what is wrong with the recent meta-analyses that Kresser was citing. But Khan preferred to come back to his clean linear story tying together the totality of the evidence. But again, Khan saw the big picture and the totality of the evidence as tying together all those pieces with biochemistry and pivotal studies. Kresser was focusing on the totality of the randomized controlled trials in recent meta-analysis. I, I think we should move on, but no, what? we definitely shouldn't because we're not we're okay. not really clearing this up. What is he saying that's wrong? Okay. The broadest view from 50,000 feet up, biochemistry supports it, epidemiology supports it, 395 metabolic ward studies, my randomized Mendelian randomization What's wrong with study. What he said, though? Because he's not looking at the entirety of the data. And I'm telling you the entire data. Then you go to Loma Linda, Okinawa, you go to Icaros, you go to Costa Rica, and you go to Sardinia. I just mentioned three very large meta-analyses of randomized controlled trials that failed to confirm any association of saturated fat and heart disease and, and or saturated fat and increase in these risk markers. And I mentioned two reviews of very large uh, observational study data, including 350,000 in, in one study and 650 in another, showing no relationship. So the mechanistic arguments about liver, you know, like saturated fat does this or that, uh, that's not convincing if it's not showing up in, in the data. If, if it did that, then we would see it in the observational studies and the randomized studies. Now, specifically, Joel, now, what is your take on what he just said? What? Rogan kept accusing Khan of relying on outdated information when he was reaching back to the pivotal studies. So, so is the problem well, that you're citing epidemiology studies from the 1940s and the whoa. 1950s? 1985 Nobel Prize in Medicine. Okay, Nobody. Wait, let's not go to the 80s again. When you, when you, when you keep going to these so, old studies, yeah. well, so, I just want and, you to refute what okay. he's saying about well, these recent studies. Okay, so, I mean, I'm not stuck in the 1950s, but, you know, if you but don't... you would agree right. that science has moved far past that, and our understanding well, of nutrition and our understanding of the, the mechanisms of the effect of the food on the body, all that has changed radically. But our understanding of nutrition is advanced pretty radically yeah. since 2004. And, and I'm, I'm not. At one point, Rogan even suggested that something could be outdated because it's as old as 2016. Published. So the USDA republishes every five years, 2016, not long every ago. Every five years. 2016 was the last USDA publication. They'll do it again in 2020. But doesn't this science change pretty not rapidly? That fast. Not that fast. Not Ultimately, this topic of saturated fat and heart disease never came to any clear resolution, in large part because Khan suggested that the recent meta-analyses that Chris Kresser was using were seriously flawed but they were never able to debate the specific reasons for any of those flaws. And that's because the reason that different meta-analyses have come to different conclusions about the role of sat, about the whether saturated fat causes heart disease largely comes down to the choice to include or exclude certain studies in the past. And the only way that they would have been able to debate the different conclusions of the meta-analyses would be to actually show the data up on a screen and specifically discuss why specific studies were included or excluded or why statistical analyses were done one or another way. Perhaps many people would have gotten lost with a format like that, but without the ability to specifically discuss the data on air, it just came down to this meta-analysis is good, no, it's BS, and that was that. 
I have a position on this. In fact, I've done my own analysis of all the randomized controlled trials testing whether saturated fat causes heart disease. I'm not going to go into my analysis here, but I'll link to my analysis in the description of this video. And I would encourage you to look at the references that that both participants in the debate put up. I'll link to those as well, and you'll be able to look at the different analyses if you're interested in coming to your own conclusions. What I will say here is that I agree with Kresser that randomized controlled trials do not convincingly support that saturated fat causes heart disease. With that said, I believe that Kresser was mistaken to say that saturated fat on average does not raise cholesterol levels. I think he was correct that saturated fat does raise cholesterol levels in some people and not others, but on average, saturated fat, even in long, even in the long term, does raise cholesterol levels. What you see on the screen is data from the LA Veterans Administration Hospital study. This is the longest study ever conducted of substituting saturated fat, substituting polyunsaturated fat for saturated fat, looking at the effect on cholesterol levels and heart disease. And in the experimental diet, you had polyunsaturated fat. In the control diet, you had saturated fat. These diets were otherwise exactly the same, with the exception that there were fewer eggs in the experimental diet. So there was also a reduction in dietary cholesterol. And there was a component of the fat in the control group that wasn't just saturated, but included hydrogenated oils. Overall, though, this is reflecting the main difference, which is the difference between saturated fat on the top and polyunsaturated fat on the bottom. You can see at the very beginning of the study, there's a huge divergence in cholesterol levels where polyunsaturated is lower, saturated is higher. And you can see that over the course of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years, right up until the study was terminated between the seventh and eighth year, although the cholesterol levels changed over time, this big gap between the two diets remained. That to me means that even over the long term of years, saturated fat can saturated fat raises cholesterol levels relative to polyunsaturated fat. Now, although we have very few such studies lasting years and none except the one I just showed you that lasted over seven years, there have been a much greater number of shorter term trials. Shown on the screen is a meta-analysis of 60 such trials where they had to last more than 13 days on the basis that that's the length of time that it usually takes for a new stable diet to cause a change in cholesterol levels. In the first table of that analysis, you can go to the second row to look at the change in total cholesterol of substituting saturated fats or polyunsaturated fats for carbohydrates. Ignoring the specific numbers just for the sake of simplicity, you can see that there's a positive change when you change carbohydrates to saturated fats, and it's highly statistically significant. But when you change carbohydrates to polyunsaturated fats, you can see there's a negative change that is also highly statistically significant. That means that out of the three nutrients, saturated fats lead to the highest cholesterol levels, polyunsaturated fats to the lowest cholesterol levels, and carbohydrates intermediate. You can also see this effect when you look at the lifelong effects of consuming a traditional whole foods diet. We can see this by looking at the Pacific Island diets of Tokelau, Puka Puka, and Katava. On these three islands, the main difference is the relative amount of coconut versus starchy tubers in the diet. On the island of Tokelau, the coconut and therefore saturated fat is the highest and the starch is the lowest, and that's where you see the highest cholesterol levels. In Katava, the diet is almost the same, but the starch is higher and the coconut is lower, and that's where you see the lowest cholesterol levels. Puka Puka has intermediate coconut, intermediate starch, and that's where you see the cholesterol levels that are right in the middle of the other two islands. But as Khan and Kresser both agreed, the change or whether you see the change is going to be different in different people. And as Kresser pointed out, 
saturated fat's not going to raise cholesterol levels in some people. And the much more important point is that just because saturated fat raises cholesterol doesn't mean that it causes heart disease. And my analysis of the randomized controlled trials agrees with Cresser's. Again, mine is linked in the description of this video that the randomized controlled trials do not convincingly show that saturated fat increases the risk of heart disease. Additionally, it wasn't just that Khan was looking for the linear string of clean data that all supported the main hypothesis. It was also that his analyses of mechanisms, although he clearly had expertise in these mechanisms and understood them, the way that he presented them was generally too simplistic to the point of being misleading. In fact, at one point, Khan's explanation of mechanism became so overly simplistic that he said that he knew that cholesterol and not sugar causes heart disease because he scooped cholesterol out of arteries 50,000 times and he's never scooped sugar out of an artery. I've been inside a heart 15,000 times. I've never scooped sugar out of a blocked artery. I scooped cholesterol out of blocked arteries. 20% of every blockage in a heart is cholesterol. It's a fact that was discovered in 1910. It's never varied. While this makes a nice sound bite, it's just completely silly because the fact that sugar is not found in the artery doesn't mean that sugar doesn't affect mechanisms in the body that cause the cholesterol to get into the artery. That's something that needs to be looked at with science. But let's put sugar aside and just look at why Khan's major explanation of the mechanism of heart disease was too simplistic. Although Khan is completely correct that on average, saturated fats raise cholesterol levels in the blood, cholesterol levels don't simply get into an artery because they're in the blood. Just being there doesn't make the cholesterol get into the artery. There is a great deal of mechanistic evidence on how cholesterol gets into an artery. In the blood, cholesterol is contained in lipoproteins such as the LDL particle. On the surface of the LDL particle, there's a membrane that contains many different types of fatty acids. Polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are most abundant in vegetable oils, not animal foods, are uniquely vulnerable to a form of damage called oxidation. And in the membrane of that particle, the more polyunsaturated fatty acids you have, the more vulnerable to damage that particle will be. When the particle gets damaged, the immune system becomes involved in taking up that particle and that drives the process of atherosclerotic plaque. Although saturated fats raise cholesterol and polyunsaturated fats lower cholesterol, saturated fats displace polyunsaturated fats in the LDL particle membrane and make it less vulnerable to that form of damage, whereas polyunsaturated fatty acids make the LDL particle more vulnerable to that type of damage. So does saturated fat increase the risk of heart disease by raising cholesterol levels, or does it decrease the risk of heart disease by protecting the LDL particle from oxidation? Focusing on the mechanism itself doesn't tell us the answer. We need to look at the data, and so it ultimately does come down to which meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials do you believe? The one that pools all the data and says that saturated fat causes heart disease, or the one that pools all the data and says that it doesn't? Getting into that brings us back to debating the specific data in those reviews, something that the podcast format just didn't allow. Again, a link to my analysis and the ones that Cresser and Khan used for the, for the debate in the description of this video so you can come to your own conclusion. Out of the four harmful mechanisms that Khan attributed to animal products, we have covered saturated fat, and the next on the list is cholesterol. Very little attention to cholesterol was paid in this debate. Cresser took the position that eggs don't raise cholesterol levels in the majority of people, and in those where they do, they don't impact the ratio of LDL to HDL. So they've done controlled feeding studies where they fed people two to four eggs a day, and those show that in 75% of cases, that has zero impact on blood cholesterol levels. 
For the other 25% of people, they're termed hyper-responders. And in that group, dietary cholesterol or, or does modestly increase LDL cholesterol, but it also increases HDL cholesterol, and it does not increase the risk of heart disease. Khan took the position that you probably don't see an effect of eggs in studies because they're adding the cholesterol on top of a diet that already has cholesterol in it. And you would see an effect if you added it to a cholesterol-free diet. How much yours is going to raise and how much mine is going to raise is going to depend on your genetics and your microbiome and where you're starting. If I ate a steak, my cholesterol goes up. If I ate an egg, this has been shown because I don't eat any dietary cholesterol as a plant eater, my cholesterol skyrockets. You become habituated eating two, three eggs a day and the curve flattens out after two, three eggs a day, which is four or 500 milligrams of cholesterol a day. It's like if you smoke 20 cigarettes and you go to 24, it's going to be pretty hard to show much of a difference. Two, three eggs a day for a chronic eater is tough to challenge. So but, your body just creates a tolerance for it? Is that well, what you're there's, saying? There's a level of absorption that starts to level off. Khan also took the position that cholesterol is a much less important factor in heart disease simply because we only consume three or 400 milligrams of cholesterol compared to 150 grams of fat. But um, the, an interesting statistic, a toothpick is 100 milligrams. Most of us eat three to 400 milligrams of cholesterol a day, three to four toothpicks. We're talking, sat we're talking fat, we're talking 150 grams. So that's why the saturated fat, it's like overwhelmingly more of a topic than three to, three to four toothpicks of cholesterol a day. This particular argument is dubious because 150 grams of fat are never going to be turned into 150 grams of cholesterol. In fact, the total pool of cholesterol between what you synthesize and what you take in from the diet is usually around 2,000 milligrams or 2 grams. Three or 400 milligrams of dietary cholesterol against 2,000 milligrams total daily pool is actually a lot. We're talking 20% of the total pool of cholesterol. With that said, the reason why the effect of dietary cholesterol on blood cholesterol levels is so equivocal is because our bodies naturally regulate how much cholesterol we have. And when we eat more cholesterol, we make less cholesterol. And so sometimes you see an increase in blood cholesterol in some people, but in many people you don't because the body simply regulates the cholesterol pool itself. I thought it was unfortunate that so little attention was paid to cholesterol in this debate when cholesterol is found exclusively in animal products and is dramatically different between a vegan diet and an animal-inclusive diet when that's not true of saturated fat at all. On the other hand, this might reflect that there simply is far less evidence to deal with when we're talking about cholesterol because there are no long-term randomized controlled trials specifically altering cholesterol levels in the diet to look at the risk of heart disease like there is for saturated fat. In fact, many of the studies whose main goal was to change the type of fat also changed the cholesterol with the cholesterol being the more minor part of the intervention. But there's just no data to tease apart the question of saturated fat versus cholesterol. With little to say about cholesterol, Let's move on to the third component of animal products that Khan said was harmful, which is the generation of a compound called TMAO when we consume foods like eggs and meat. Although Chris Kresser had fleetingly mentioned TMAO earlier in the debate, TMAO came up when Rogan kept pressing Khan to not focus on outdated data. Khan then offered TMAO as an example of a recent advance in physiology that shows the harmfulness of animal products. Um, has, has human physiology been challenged? I'll give you another. We've learned, and Chris mentioned this, so I think it's fair to go there. It's like a court of law. He opened it up. I'm cross-examining. Nobody in the world ever heard the word of four letters, T-M-A-O, 2011. Cardiologist sitting at the Cleveland Clinic said, there's got to be more in the blood that hurts arteries. Let's go find them. They found this chemical. They learned how to measure it. They patented how to measure it, T-M-A-O. They took 4,000 people on the cath lab table. They said, I wonder if the level of T-M-A-O in the blood correlates with how clogged up your arteries are. But doom, it worked perfect. Then they figured out if you eat red meat that has rich in L-carnitine amino acid, you eat eggs that's rich in choline and uh, a nutrient, I think amino acid, I'm blanking for a minute, 
those directly led your liver to create TMAO. They took studies where they reduced carnitine, reduced choline in the diet, TMAO goes down. What does TMAO do? It stuns your HDL so it doesn't reverse cholesterol transport. It causes LDL to enter the cell wall and create foam cells, macrophages, plaque, and you get a heart attack. It actually screws up your kidney and causes it to be fibrosed. If you have heart failure, diabetes, or heart disease, or hypertension, your TMAO is up. I've actually drawn more TMAO levels than I think any physician in the United States. This is my baby. New human physiology that has not led us to back off the idea that limiting the animal product consumption, in this case specifically egg yolk and red meat, may have benefit to your health. Now, here's Cresser pressing con on where TMAO mostly comes from. We just learned a new Actually, pathway. Actually, Joel, what, what, increase, what in the diet increases TMAO orders of magnitude more fish, than Because fish meat. has it right in their fish flesh along with that mercury in their PCBs. Right, and- That's right, fish. Take a look at this graph that had come up in the debate. This is a graph that I made in 2011 that Chris Kresser used in his article on TMAO on his website. This is a graph produced from a peer-reviewed paper where humans were fed different foods and they looked at the amount of TMAO produced as based on the amount that appeared in the urine. And what you can see here is that eggs and beef hardly show up on this graph at all. In fact, the control, which was water, was higher than the beef. The two bars that stick out are the cod and halibut. Not because cod and halibut are unique among fish, but because these are the two foods that I used as representative of the many fish that they tested. And even cod, the lower one, is 67 times greater than the beef. But remember, the beef didn't generate any appreciable TMAO at all because the beef isn't higher than the control. So we have the fish causing 60-fold increases in TMAO and the eggs and beef doing nothing. That data is taken from this peer-reviewed paper. If you look at the lower right corner of table two, you can see that it's not just cod and halibut, but most of the fish bring TMAO up into the thousands compared to the background control of 150. Kresser then asked Khan, what do we know about the relationship between fish and heart disease? Is, DDT. What is the association of seafood intake with heart disease well, and can, mortality? Can, Although we don't have strong evidence from randomized controlled trials about what it does to your risk of heart disease when you consume fish, the overall picture so far of what we have is that people who eat more fish tend to, if anything, have a lower rate of heart disease. Now, could it be that there are things that are so protective in fish that they just outweigh the presence of TMAO, this very harmful compound? Sure, there could be. I mean, there's no particular reason not to believe that there aren't multiple things having different and even opposite effects in a food. But if the TMAO that's circulating in the average person from the meat and eggs that they consume in the average diet is contributing appreciably to the risk of heart disease that we see in the general population, how can it not be that fish causing 50 or 60 or 70 times more TMAO aren't leading to 50 or 60 or 70 times that contribution to heart disease? What are the components in fish that are going to counteract that? Is it the omega-3 fatty acids? Omega-3 fatty acids from fish oils are equivocal in terms of whether they reduce the risk of heart disease. If they do reduce the risk of heart disease, it's a modest effect, maybe a 30% decrease. Sure, there are other nutrients in fish, like the iodine and selenium, but do we know anything about these nutrients that suggest that they could counteract a 50 or 60 or 70 fold increase in something that we believe that is a major driver of heart disease risk? If TMAO is such an important driver of heart disease risk, we shouldn't require great difficulty to tease out the subtle effects of fish 
we should see the dramatic increase in TMAO accumulation that fish causes in a dramatic effect in aggravating the risk of heart disease. And if we don't see that relationship, the TMAO advocates need to do a lot more work to convince me that there's a causal relationship between meat and eggs, TMAO, and heart disease. We've looked at saturated fat, cholesterol, and TMAO. The last thing we'll look at now is animal protein. Specifically, animal protein is rich in an amino acid known as methionine. And here is Dr. Joel Kahn explaining how methionine accelerates aging by stimulating the mTOR pathway. The, pro, the amino acids found in red meat uh, combined with their saturated fat that's content triggers a pathway that accelerates aging. You don't want to age fast. That's called the mTOR pathway, the IGF-1 pathway. You should be concerned that animal protein accelerates aging through Does mTOR that, and IGF-1. True? But we do know that meat rich in methionine will activate mTOR and IGF-1, and it is a very strong factor in aging. You want a low methionine diet. Here's Kresser explaining why too much methionine may well in fact be harmful, but only because it's out of balance with other amino acids such as glycine and with the B vitamins that are involved in methionine metabolism. I'm open Go over to this. the possibility that high intakes of methionine, which is not one of the amino acids in animal protein, in the absence of sufficient intakes of glycine, which is another amino acid that's in animal proteins, and then intake of nutrients like B12 and B6 and B9, which is folate, could some of the animal studies suggest that that has an effect on longevity. But this is why I've always been an advocate of eating nose to tail. So not just eating lean meats that are very high in methionine, making sure you're getting enough of the glycine-rich foods, the bone broth, etc., and then you're also eating plenty of, you know, a mixed diet that contains B12 and folate and B6 and the other nutrients that balance out the effects of excess methionine. On this point, I completely agree with Kresser, and I want to dive into the mechanisms a little bit more deeply. This is another case where Khan clearly had expertise and knowledge about a mechanism but his explanation of that mechanism was too simplistic to the point of being misleading. Yes, methionine is important in stimulating the mTOR pathway, and yes, there's a body of evidence suggesting that overstimulation of the mTOR pathway could accelerate the process of aging. But how does methionine stimulate the mTOR pathway? Well, let's consider what methionine is. Methionine is an amino acid, and you could divide it into two components that are important to our discussion. One is there's a basic skeleton of that amino acid, and on top of that, there's what we call a methyl group, which is a single carbon atom. That methyl group is what supports an entire system in the body called methylation that is important to all kinds of mental and physical health. In order for methionine to stimulate the mTOR pathway, it needs to donate that methyl group. And so if you have too much methionine, you could have too many of those methyl groups and you could have too much stimulation of the mTOR pathway and you could accelerate aging. But we have an amino acid that we use as a buffer of too many methyl groups and that amino acid is known as glycine, the amino acid that Chris Kresser mentioned when he was talking about the importance of balance. Glycine is found in collagen-rich tissues like skin and bones. Our ancestors ate the whole animal. They didn't just eat the muscle meat, they also ate the skin and bones. When you eat the muscle meat, you get methionine. When you eat the skin and bones, you get more glycine, and you have these two amino acids in balance. When you only eat the muscle meat, you only get the methionine, and that's where you would expect to have excessive stimulation of the mTOR pathway. Once methionine donates that methyl group, it becomes homocysteine. And homocysteine is thought to contribute to cardiovascular disease. And in order to get rid of the homocysteine, you need all the B vitamins that Chris Kresser was talking about. So yes, that incoming methionine might excessively stimulate the mTOR pathway if you don't have the glycine from skin and bones. And it might lead to excessive accumulation of homocysteine if you don't have the B vitamins. But even those B vitamins depend in part on animal products because one of those important B vitamins needed 
to metabolize that homocysteine is vitamin B12, which studies show vegetarians and vegans are far more likely to be deficient in. This was a point that Kresser and Kahn both agreed on. So these are the major mechanisms that Kahn identified as harmful effects of animal products. One of the points that Kresser opened with and that he kept returning to throughout the debate was that we need to look at total mortality because if we don't see vegetarians and vegans having a convincingly longer life, then whatever mechanisms we're talking about, about potential harms, just don't seem that important if they're not playing out in causing greater disease burdens that lead to greater effects on total mortality. Total mortality is the most important endpoint we should be talking about here. That means deaths from any cause, okay? Right? So if because that's what we care about most, right? If you right. if I die of uh, you know, if if I if if an intervention reduces the risk of a heart attack but increases the risk of cancer, I'm not happy with that, right? <laughs> right? In fact, I'd rather go out and have a heart attack in, in my sleep. One shot, yeah. bam. Yeah. Um, so you need to consider total mortality. And if something, you know, if meat increases the risk of cancer uh, and cancer mortality, then why aren't we seeing that in the studies that compared lifespan with vegetarians and omnivores? The question itself of whether vegetarianism and veganism affects total mortality is, of course, something that is intrinsically difficult to disentangle because there are studies suggesting that vegetarians and vegans do live longer. And there are many observational studies that Khan likes to use, such as looking at regions where people live very long lives or looking at migration patterns and how those impacted the risk of death and how that correlates with animal product consumption that Chris Kresser dismisses on the basis that there are too many confounding variables. For example, in areas where people live very long lives, they may be doing many different things differently and you don't know which ones are important. When you look at migration patterns, you're seeing people change not only their diets, but their lifestyle and other things. Additionally, in observational studies of vegetarians and vegans comparing them to omnivores, you have to look at the healthy user bias, which Kresser described. Because, you know, when someone engages in an unhealthy, in a behavior that's perceived as unhealthy, they are more likely to engage in other behaviors that are perceived as unhealthy and vice versa. So let's say you do a study of people who ate, eat more red meat. Well, red meat has been perceived as unhealthy for a long time. And so what we know is that in those observational studies, the people who eat more red meat are also smoking more, they have higher body mass index, they're eating less, fewer fruits and vegetables, they have a lower level of education, they're less physically active. So how do you know that it's the red meat that's causing the problem and not those other things? You don't, because they cannot control for all of those potential confounding factors. Kahn and Kresser both agreed on the existence of the healthy user bias. Kresser pointed out that the studies comparing longevity between vegetarians, vegans, and omnivores that best accounted for the healthy user bias were the studies that didn't show any impact on total mortality. We have, as I said, we have uh, five studies that did a better job of controlling for that healthy user bias, and there was no difference in any of those studies. There's not a single study that, sh that, that compared you know, relatively equivalent groups of people that shows that vegetarians or vegans have a lifespan advantage, period. There is not. This was a point that Kahn never explicitly disputed, and I think Kresser was right to keep coming back to the point that many of these arguments just aren't convincing when we don't see them translating into a difference in total mortality between vegetarians, vegans, and omnivores. One of the topics that got a significant amount of attention that wasn't focused specifically on the mechanisms that Kahn was attributing to animal products was the topic of cancer. Repeatedly, Kresser referred to the 18% increase in cancer risk that the World Health Organization used in their recent report. Okay, the, IR, the IARC, the WHO report that suggested that processed red meat was a carcinogen, that was 18% increase. By contrast, Khan kept referring to a three or 400% increase in the risk of cancer attributable to a high intake of animal protein. 
2014. Actually, let me go to 2014. Morgan Levine. This is an amazing Harvard researcher, beautiful woman, Morgan Levine. She looked at 6,000 people prospectively. Observation, fill out all these data. If you were an animal protein eater, that's called meat, you had a three to 400% increase in cancer risk. Three to 400%, that's three to four times, isn't 1.1, 1.08, 18%. The data is there. This is peer reviewed data. If you ate plant based proteins, the risk of cancer goes down. That Khan kept referring to 400% and Kresser kept referring to 18% reflects the fact that Kresser was focusing on the totality of the data pooled together and Khan was focusing on individual studies when they were important and consistent with his overall hypothesis. As for the 18% figure, Kresser pointed out that this is a smaller increase in risk than what you see when you look at the correlation between being a Sagittarius and being hospitalized for arm fracture. There's a great study done, one of my favorites, um, that was purposely done to illustrate the danger of assuming that correlation equals causation. It was a study done of uh, the most common diagnoses for hospitalization in Canada, 10.6 million people. And they found that 24 diagnoses were significantly associated with the participants' astrological signs. <laughs> so, Taurus, people, who baby. Born, people who were born under the sign of Leo had a 15% higher risk of being hospitalized for gastrointestinal hemorrhage, and Sagittarians had a 38% higher risk of being hospitalized for an arm fracture. Now, remember... The the, can, the the proposed increase in risk of, for for processed meat and cancer is eighteen percent. Kresser's point was that observational studies and correlations therein don't tell us necessarily about cause and effect relationships. And when we are going to look at observational studies showing these correlations and infer causation, we want to see really big associations like we've seen for aflatoxin or cigarette smoking. Kresser referenced the Bradford Hill criteria of seeing a large association as indicating a likelihood of a cause and effect relationship. On the other hand, Kahn pointed out that this 18% increase could translate into 50 or 60,000 people dying of cancer, which is not insignificant. The real question though is whether this is a cause and effect relationship. Now, I don't agree with Kresser that we should just dismiss the 18% figure because it's so small. Just because it's small doesn't mean that there's no cause and effect relationship. But we don't have randomized controlled trials showing that animal protein causes cancer or that it doesn't cause cancer. So what are we going to rely on? Well, it comes down to mechanistic studies. And what do they tell us? Here's Kresser suggesting that everything we know about the proposed mechanisms of how animal products might cause cancer suggests that they're nullified by consuming them together with plant foods. Several proposed mechanisms for how processed meat causes cancer. One is that it increases N-nitroso compounds, or NOCs, which damage, damage the gut lining. Another is that uh, they, when you cook meat at a high temperature, it forms heterocyclic amines, or HCAs, which damage the gut. Another is that the heme iron content uh, in meat uh, causes oxidative stress and, and increases the risk of cancer that way. And then there's TMAO and new 5 gc But let me just give you a few examples of why context is important. So there's evidence that chlorophyll-rich green vegetables prevent myoglobin from being turned into N-nitroso compounds. So if you're eating processed meat, but you're also eating kale and broccoli, then it's not going to have the same effect on the body as if you're just eating a hot dog. Um, cruciferous vegetables and spices and marinades have been shown to reduce the formation of heterocyclic amines or HCAs. So same thing. If you're, you know, if you're marinating meat or if you're eating broccoli and cruciferous vegetables with meat, it's not going to have the same impact. There are several studies that have shown that eating fruits and vegetables attenuates the oxidative capacity of heme iron and even reduces the absorption of heme iron in the gut. Saying, I, I'm open to the possibility that too much processed meat can be problematic, yeah. but you have to consider the context. It's not going to have the same effect if someone's eating a ton of fruits and vegetables versus the, someone who's on a standard American diet. And we have no studies that separate that out. Although Kahn framed it somewhat differently because he sees the animal products as intrinsically harmful, Kahn agreed that including plants with your animal foods is a good idea. 
<laughs> Next time you eat meat, get a salad. Next time you meet, order broccoli. Next time you have bacon, get a get a you know sliced tomatoes. You will actually improve your health. There's this classic, and now I'm shifting to cardiology, that they took uh, healthy volunteers and they took them down the hospital cafeteria and they fed them a hospital burger and they were measuring on their arm how their art- arteries function cardiology topic. Artery function goes down in three hours when you eat a hospital burger. It acts like you just had a toxin in your body. You did. They took the same group a week later. They had to meet the same burger with a big salad. They didn't see that finding. I mean, I want this to be an important point. You know, everybody should be jamming fruits and vegetables, or at least vegetables with some fruits. You can go low glycemic berries. I'm fine with papayas, cantaloupe, and apples. But, you know, up your veggies, listeners, and you'll counteract a lot of the crap that's out there in the world. It's an important message. Now, where did this 400% figure come from, that CONCAP sighting? Shown on the screen is the paper taken directly from CONS references. You can see that this is Morgan Levine, published in 2014. Just look at the title. Low protein intake is associated with major reduction in IGF-1, cancer, and overall mortality in the 65 and younger, but not older, population. Take a look at the abstract. At first, it supports what Khan was saying. Respondents aged 50 to 65 reporting high protein intake had a 75% increase in overall mortality and a fourfold increase in cancer and diabetes mortality during an 18-year follow-up period. These associations were either abolished or attenuated if the source of proteins was plant-based. But here's the part that he didn't tell us. Conversely, in respondents over the age of 65, high protein intake was associated with reduced cancer and overall mortality. Well, wait a second. Who's more likely to die, someone under the age of 65 or over the age of 65? Who's more likely to get cancer, someone under the age of 65 or over the age of 65? Even from this study alone, it's hard to make heads or tails out of it. If, in fact, protein was neutral after 65, but really harmful under 65, then I could see that it would be a net benefit. But if protein has the opposite effect after 65, when both cancer and mortality are far more relevant, and if cancer and dying are both things impacted by decades of what you do leading up to them, how do you know exactly what to do from this study? Furthermore, a 400% increase? Surely if this is a general effect that we can see across the board, then it should feed into an increase in total mortality in the overall data for vegetarians and vegans. And like Kresser kept coming back to, we're not seeing that. In fact, when you look at the cancer data overall, we're looking at this 18% figure. So this is a great example of why we don't want to focus on an individual study just because it makes sense in how we're lining up everything, we really have to look at the broad totality of the data. And that's something that Kresser was coming down more strongly on than Khan. This idea of whether animal products are harmful got most of the attention in the debate. However, the other idea of for the nutrients that are best gotten from animal foods, is it better to get them from foods instead of getting them from supplements? This is something that got very little attention in the debate, but here's Kresser explaining why he thinks food is always the better default. Yes, you can supplement, but it just, you know, are, do, do the supplements have the same effect? Like look at calcium. Dietary calcium has inversely related to heart disease and kidney stones, meaning the, the more dietary calcium you eat, the lower risk of those conditions. But when you look at studies on calcium supplements, the opposite is true. Calcium supplements are associated with an increase in heart disease and an increase in kidney stones. So Associated so, by epidemiology studies? Yes. Yes. So, but, but the theory is that, that because you, when, with supplemental calcium, it's not the same as dietary calcium. You mm-hmm. get a large bolus of calcium that goes into your blood all at once, and then it can get into the soft tissues, which 
you know, can make them stiffer, which is Joel will tell you is not good for, right. for your heart health. And so my point is that supplements don't always affect the body in the mm. same way. That's why I just think it's better to get nutrients from food if you can, because that's the way we've been getting them for right. millions of years, you know? On this point, I agree with Cresser. Sometimes a nutrient is distributed in food differently. So that very same thing, calcium, same mineral in the food and out of it may act differently in the food than in the supplement. Also, sometimes the supplement has that nutrient in a different form that's not as good as what you would find in food. I would add a couple things here. Both animal and plant foods have things other than the essential vitamins and minerals that have positive health effects. For example, in plant foods, we have thousands of polyphenolic compounds that have widely ranging activities that can affect health in all sorts of ways. They're not essential nutrients, but they do have positive health value. In animal products, we have things like carnitine and taurine and carnosine that are not essential nutrients, but do have positive health value. Quite often, there are synergistic interactions between nutrients. Foods provide a complex array of nutrients that are in a certain balance, and we might not be getting the same balance when we're taking supplements. This is especially true of supplements with these other compounds that are not essential vitamins and minerals. Sometimes these two have synergies, and we probably are just on the brink of discovering what they are. For example, there's a study suggesting that the anti-cancer effects of the compounds found in green tea are far stronger when you combine all the major compounds of green tea than when you just pick out the most effective one and administer it on its own. Will we continue to see other synergies that we don't know about in plants? And will we also wind up seeing these same synergies play out in the compounds found in animal products? Finally, the history of nutrition is one that suggests that at any given point in time, when you assume you know everything that's important, you get yourself into trouble. For example, look at the case of total parenteral nutrition or TPN. This is when you receive all your food intravenously. At first, we didn't know about the importance of omega-3 fatty acids, and so only omega-6 fatty acids were added in appreciable amounts to TPN. What happened? A six-year-old with an abdominal gunshot wound who was on TPN for six months developed severe neurological problems until she was given omega-3 fatty acids. And this was how we discovered that omega-3 fatty acids are important. It wasn't until about the year 2000 that we realized that people on TPN were getting fatty liver because there was no choline added to it. This is how we discovered that choline is an essential nutrient. We saw the same thing in laboratory animals. In the 1970s, scientists invented purified diets that were all standardized to have exactly the same nutrients, and they were made from scratch with individual nutrients instead of foods. This was to better standardize research. But what happened was when these purified diets replaced the natural food-based diets, all the animals started getting sicker. They developed all kinds of diseases and vulnerabilities that they didn't have when they were just eating the old cereal-based diets. After that, researchers spent 20 years figuring out what else to put in these diets, and they wound up changing a lot of the nutrients, adding more nutrients in, and then even taking so-called ultra-trace minerals, saying, we don't even know if these have an effect, but let's add them in just in case. If we all agree that there are certain nutrients that are better or more easily gotten from animal products, can we really say, like Khan does, that it's better to avoid the harms that he attributes to animal products and just take those specific nutrients as supplements? Maybe, but what if there are many other things or many synergistic interactions in those animal foods that we have yet to discover? I'm not against supplements, but on this point, I side with Cresser that it's better as your default to choose foods instead of supplements. Supplements are called supplements because they supplement what you try to get from natural foods. At the end of the debate, 
the topic of the carnivore diet came up. The carnivore diet is essentially the opposite of veganism. Instead of not eating any animal foods, you don't eat any plant foods. It's espoused by people like Michaela Peterson and Sean Baker. Many people report improvements in health conditions with the carnivore diet. Chris Kresser offered his hypothesis on why. Uh, this is just a theory. I have nothing to, okay. uh, you know, I don't have any evidence, but when you eat, meat is absorbed very high up in the digestive tract. And so when you only eat meat, it's a low residue diet and there's nothing left over to irritate or inflame the gut. My theory is a lot of people who are benefiting from this have a really disrupted gut microbiome. Alessio Fasano has argued that leaky gut is kind of a precondition for autoimmunity. And this, the carnivore diet is essentially like a gut rest or a fast. That the carnivore diet might be giving a break to the lower digestive system is an interesting and important point that I hadn't thought of before. I would also add that there are many compounds in plants that can be problematic. There are compounds like oxalates, certain lectins, and other anti-nutrients or potentially toxic factors that some people's systems may not tolerate or people may have negative reactions to. And so some people may be benefiting from removing those. Khan wondered where they were getting their vitamin C from and suggested that maybe they were getting enough vitamin C because they were consuming organ meats, raw meats, or because they had better absorption of small amounts by removing glucose or other competing factors in the gut. Where are these people when every chart says that meat has no vitamin C? Are they eating raw meat, which might have vitamin C? Are they eating organ meat, which might have some vitamin well, let me, C? Let me stop you there because I'll tell you what the ex explanation's been to yeah. me. The explanation to me has been that there is a decrease in absorption of vitamin C when you're consuming vitamin C with all these other things, cruciferous vegetables, right. carbohydrates, right. all it, these different things. Right. There's some sort of a... There's an adverse effect. Is that is that a fact? Well, it, the pers if you take a thousand milligrams of vitamin C, you'll absorb a lot of it. You take ten thousand milligrams uh, on percentage, you won't absorb as much, but you'll still get more than a thousand milligrams. Right. But there's also this theory that since they're eating basically a no added glucose diet, that there's some kind of competition in us yes. between glucose and C. So even if they right. get a a touch of C, they're absorbing it hyper efficiently. Nobody knows. Khan, Kresser, and Rogan all agreed that while many people may get short-term benefit on the carnivore diet, we don't know about the long-term safety of this diet. And so I don't, you know, doubt that people are benefiting from it. The question is, what is the long-term implication? Well, I mean, the point is, we just don't know. We don't know. And, and I, it seems I, so I, risky. I, I mean, as a, as a practitioner yeah. myself and as someone who's dealt with chronic illness, who, who yeah. wasn't able to find help anywhere else, I mean, I, I do not begrudge people for sticking with something right. that, that, that works. when they've tried everything and nothing has worked and they do this and they feel good. I mean, who can blame them? It's, it's well, I've really... gone to dinner with Jordan, Jordan Peterson. He's eating his big giant steaks and he looks yeah. great. Well, I mean, you know, he's lighter than he's been since he was 25 true. years and I, old. And I'm, I'm 100% empathetic with, with right. that because I've been through something like that myself. But to, right. to then take that and say that we're certain that it's safe is a yeah. big leap. Yeah. And right. the other so, thing is, you know, my field, atherosclerosis, takes years to develop. And I wish him well. He's contributing amazing things in the world. But unless he's tracking carotid and coronary and doing it year after year after year, you know, it's an experiment you might not want to run. But if Sean you can find, did run those tests it, it and baseline, his results baseline, were yeah. baseline. Yeah. Some, yeah. some nutrient deficiencies also take many years yeah. to develop. Yeah. Right. So, so, so that's another thing know, to consider. Sean, now, I would like to add that there are several important similarities between veganism and carnivorism. These diets are both extreme diets that cut out a huge chunk of healthy foods. People self-select these diets. People go vegan for specific reasons. Sometimes that's because of their ethics and values, but sometimes it's because they're trying to treat a certain health condition or improve their health in a certain way. People generally go carnivore because they're trying to resolve certain health problems. People don't just self-select to go on the diet, they self-select to stay on the diet. If you go carnivore and it doesn't work for you and it makes you feel, ter feel terrible, you're probably not gonna stay carnivore for long. If you go vegan and you feel terrible and it doesn't work for you, you're probably not gonna stay vegan for long. So to point to healthy vegans and to point to healthy carnivores doesn't tell us that either of those diets are healthy for everyone. Similarly, just as nutritional 
needs vary from one person to the next. Nutritional needs change over time. And particularly when you are eating a diet that could in the long term actually result in nutritional deficiencies, but also on the background of being someone whose nutritional needs may change over time, we can't say that because people for a certain length of time do good on veganism or carnivory that they're going to always do well on them. There's a principle in financial management of diversification. And the idea is that you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket because you don't know if you're going to accumulate too much risk from that one thing or if you're going to miss out on important benefits from other things. In the diet, diversification has much the same value. There are certain nutritional profiles of plant foods and other nutritional profiles of animal foods. Within plants and animal foods, there are different foods with different nutritional profiles. The more we diversify across plants and animals and within plants and animals, the more likely we are to get everything that we need to get all of the benefits. The more of any one given thing we consume, the more we raise the risk that that one given thing might accumulate too much risk from whatever might be negative in that particular food. On the other hand, sometimes it makes sense to go on one of these extreme diets because there's something that you don't tolerate. For example, you may be extremely responsive to dietary cholesterol and avoiding dietary cholesterol by avoiding animal products might make sense for you. You might be extremely reactive to certain plant compounds and maybe going carnivore helps you because of that. But if you reduce your diversification, you need to pay much more attention to getting your nutritional needs, both in terms of designing your diet and in terms of monitoring how your body responds over time. Now let's come back to the original question. If we compare a whole foods plant-based vegan diet to one where some of those foods are removed and replaced with nutrient-dense animal foods, which is better? While some people may need to reduce saturated fat and cholesterol in their diets to manage their blood lipids, on the whole, the case against saturated fat and cholesterol as the drivers of heart disease in the general population is less than convincing. The case against saturated fat is largely irrelevant because you can make a vegan diet that's high in saturated fat by including coconut, and you can make an omnivorous diet low in saturated fat simply by eating low-fat foods and focusing on animal foods that are low in saturated fat. Until someone explains why fish aren't 50 times more harmful than beef in the risk of heart disease, the TMAO argument is just unconvincing. On the topic of the methionine in animal protein, there's plenty of room for more research, but the data so far suggests to me that Kresser is on point when he refers to the need to balance methionine with the glycine from skin and bones and with the B vitamins found in other whole foods. For the small effect on cancer, it's not clear whether it's a cause and effect relationship. As Kresser noted, including plant foods mitigates the effect of the production of carcinogens in meat. I would add to this that there's a body of literature suggesting that protein can accelerate cancer growth, but I'll link to my analysis in the description of this video that suggests that protein protects against cancer initiation. And so it's preventative when you don't have cancer. And although a high protein diet might accelerate the growth of cancer when you, once you have it, the experiments that dose protein alongside continuous slow dosing of carcinogens in animals suggest that higher protein is protective in that context. Although the question of foods versus supplements largely comes down to your philosophical defaults, mine lie with Cressors. I think that it's always better to default in getting all your nutrients from foods. And so that means that it's just better to include some portion of animal products on your plate. In my view, if your ethical commitment is to not eat any animal products, clearly there's no other way to do that than to not eat any animal products. But for most goals that most people would have, I don't think an absolutist exclusion of animal products makes any sense. And the reason is that you can get so much nutrition from a small amount of animal products. As Kresser pointed out in the debate, you only need a tiny amount of oysters, clams, and liver to cover many of your nutritional needs. 
This is also a point that I've been making for years. If your goal is to eat as few animal products as possible because you believe that they're harmful, you can get a lot of nutrition in that four, eight, 12 grams of liver a day. If your goal is to prevent abuse of animals, then even if they're farmed, can we really say that clams, oysters, and other bivalves are being oppressed in an inability to live out their natural life in the way that cows and chickens are when they're kept in confinement? Khan made the point that you don't have to be completely vegan to incorporate his principles. If 100% whole foods plant-based vegan is the aspiration, you can fall anywhere along a spectrum and moving on that spectrum towards whole foods plant-based vegan puts you in a better and better position. The problem with this spectrum idea is that it doesn't acknowledge the value of the animal products. It accepts and tolerates animal products when someone's on their path on that spectrum, but it doesn't acknowledge that there is positive value, positive nutritional value, where you would actually be in a better position if you never arrived at the destination point of an absolute exclusion of animal products. All right, I hope you enjoyed this post-game analysis. I'll link in the description to the debate itself, to the references that Khan and Kresser used in the debate, and to some of the links that I had mentioned over the course of this video. If you want to see more of my own work, you can find me at chrismasterjohnphd.com.